stream news of the day. Uh, we've had a hard time with titles, right? We we call it a chill stream, but it's it's very it's very much uh, driven, so it's not sitting around with long silences and stuff like that. So it's not really a chill stream, but I should probably learn how to do chill streams properly so I can relax and have a good time at this. What we do instead is more of a driven presentation where we talk about things and invite the public to talk about things. It's very much an open session. So it's kind of like, um, uh, it's kind of like an open discussion about whatever people want to discuss that's uh, happening in EVE Online. Hey, Jed Coug Jade Cougar, it's nice to see you there. Um, and now it's going to change even a little bit more. Uh, we're going to tackle news of the day and talk about what's going on, uh, especially with wars coming up. We'll talk about troop movements and what's happening. But this is also going to change towards um, Ask Me Anything CSM. I'm running for CSM 14. That's the 14th time the council has been formed. The council basically advises CCP on how to develop the game. Uh, there's three parts to it. One of the parts is to um, be a reflection board so that when CCP says these are some of the things that we're uh, developing, the CSM can say, okay, let's do a real world test uh, check on that. The changes that you have proposed are good or they're not good or they can be altered in this way or that way. And that's how the CSM works, at least in one of its capacities. Another one is it might actually hear about direction of expansions that are coming and what they have in mind for the future. And so people would need to weigh in on, is that the way the game should go or should the game go this way instead? Um, one of the big divisions has been, do we want new features or do we want to balance the game that we already have, fix the stuff that's broken or bring in new features that bring in new players? These are the kinds of things that CSM does. Uh, so I am running for that council, something I never thought I would do, but I really feel like uh, CCP needs to be pulled in a different, not a different direction, but in it needs to have some balance to uh, some of the some of the CSMs of the last two years. So I I and, and even if I did have think that CSM needed to move in that direction, it really wasn't. It really wasn't enough to get me to run, but other things have happened that have just made it possible to run. So everything's kind of lined up. And so I've decided to do something that I really wasn't expecting to do. So all that to say that these sessions every morning, uh, sorry, every Thursday and every Tuesday morning, 1600, this morning for me on the Pacific uh, US um, time zone. But it's about four o'clock, right before the uh, your, your evening. Um, these are all going to become news and ask me anything sessions. So here we are. And I have Seraph with me, Seraph Pettikane. Let me unmute you. There you go. Good afternoon from the UK. Good afternoon, UK. How are you doing, Seraph? Not too bad, not too bad. Um, just sort of sitting back a little bit and watching all the stuff going on around New Eden. Yeah, have you seen, um, well, we expect that troop movements will happen after the state of the uh, coalition that happens on Sunday. Um, at, that, at that point, we'll know where they're going, more or less, and we will see them all gathered together move at the same time. And by them, I mean the Imperium, which lives in Delve, which is this area down here. Um, that is a gigantic coalition that when deployed is um, fearsome, right? They have a ton of people and they have a ton of treasure and they have a ton of assets. So wherever they go, they're formidable. And we expect them to travel uh, up Fountain here. I don't know if you can see my mouse, so I don't think so. I'll try to fix that. And into the north, uh, they'll enter in in uh, Cloud Ring, Pure Blind, and Fade area. And then I think the target might be Tribute. That's what um, some of the rumors have been. And the owners and the, the people who own Tribute are here. See here, negative 10. That is um, Pandemic Legion. And NC is for Northern Coalition. So that's their home area. It's their stronghold. 
So we'll see what happens there. Kind of be interesting, I think. Yeah, if they actually end up going there, right? Like we still don't know for certain if they are headed there. Although it looks like Northern Coalition and PL are taking it seriously because they seem to be taking down some structures. Uh, and that's a yeah. prudent, that's with, prudent with to the do. Fact, yeah, sorry, it's just with, with the amount of spies and intel that they've got, if they're doing that sort of stuff, it, almost, you could almost suspect that it's going to be 100% guaranteed that's their target. But what I'll ask is, is, I know you're part of NC, is, is why react so soon? Oh, I think it takes time to bring things down. Uh, Keepstar takes at least, uh, what was it, 10 days? Sorry, seven days from the moment that you declare it uh, un to unanchor. It takes seven solid days for that to uh, disappear. And so if they are planning on an invasion they're not going to risk having the enemy in system in a formidable way when that thing becomes vulnerable to being picked up and ripped off. So yeah, you want to do that now. You should have done it a few days ago, which I think they have. So I suppose this sort of leaves New Eden in the, uh, the calm before the storm then of Sunday. Yeah, it's, it's almost like uh, Northern Coalition and PL are closing the shutters on the buildings, you know, as the winds are starting to kick up. That's the analogy that I would make. It doesn't mean that they're not going to fight. It doesn't mean they're going to um, turtle shell or whatever. All it means is um, they're taking away some of the fuel, right? Like they're taking away some of the fuel of victories that the Imperium might win. And it's, uh, it's, I think it's prudent to do that. You take down keep stars that you're not necessarily using if they're redundant in some way, if they serve purposes that aren't going to be important for the next month. Those are things that you would want to take out because the Imperium may not take Sov uh, because they can't really hold it. So they, they won't take it, the territory, and try to keep it. That would be, that would be an unforeseen event. But what they do want to do is did what they did last year in 2018. They came up and they destroyed uh, many, many keep stars and structures. So th the more fuel there is for them to win victories and raise morale on, the, the better it is for them. So I think this is a defensive move. And sure, you can make fun of them, and that's that's what happens all the time, right? Um, in dot gets called uh, un NC Undock or something like that, uh, which I've never quite understood. But they, you know, if you think that that makes them mad, then you keep doing it because that's what you're trying to do. And so now calling them chicken or look at them flee or whatever is psychological warfare to anger them, uh, to get at them and that sort of thing. But in reality, if you look at this as military strategy, it's prudent. I know in test it was a lot of Edsy Dockers, that's all that they seem to do. But, you, you know, when you've got... Well, that, I take issue defense. with that. That's all they seem to do, uh, because that's that's not... I, I'm not saying it's not true. I'm saying it's it's true for everybody the same. It's I don't see NC Dot, NC Dot as any any worse than anybody else in that respect if that's even a worse thing to do i think Vili would be the first person to tell you, you don't take fights you can't win if you're outnumbered you tire the enemy out by uh what's called blue balls like you either make them fight hard or you give them no fight at all and that's I how you give them the morale victory that's the big one that's what he drives home well, yeah, however, however it is that it's uh, strategic, it happens everywhere and everybody does it. Um, but, and that's totally fine. You know who doesn't care about that sort of thing are the FCs. Like the FCs are ones that don't care about it. But it does irritate um, the uh, F1 uh, players, the players that are basically line members and stuff. They get irritated because they don't want to be considered chickens. And this is where you get into the, the morale, the propaganda, the spin war of, of a war. 
that's the other half of the you know the actual getting into ships and fighting like eve is complicated in that aspect you've got the normal you f- you form a fleet up you shoot at things you kill things and then you've also then got all the the spin and propaganda and and all that sort of stuff on the other half of the fight yeah and i will attest that nc dark <laughs> when they do undark good lord are they a scary force because i faced against them in the Ouijan and for a month and a half two months myself and god damn they can be a brick wall at time you mean hard to hard to move kind of thing Oh yeah. Oh, it's like if if you don't have that critical mass of being able to do anything, they will come down and just absolutely kill your fun in seconds. Which is the whole point of what the on a defensive war is. Yeah. Yeah, I sometimes don't even realize, um, you know what NC is capable of, but um, they're. They're known for being, they're actually known for having pretty good FCs and pretty good line members. What they're not necessarily always capable of doing, which I think is true for everybody, except maybe Goon Swarm and I don't know, maybe Test Tube, is bringing everybody they can bring. Like a lot of times people don't show up to, uh, to fights. And part of that is that the guys that are in NC in groups like PL have been through usually a lot of fights so a lot of the novelties worn off a lot of the excitement they're not trying to make their bones anymore with kill boards uh so the incentive to get into a fight is is there going to be a fight you know i don't want to like get all dressed up and have nothing happen so you got to make sure that you guarantee fights so one of the things that happens in NC is the FCs will be like i'm pretty sure i'm 99% sure there's going to be a fight <laughs> Uh, because they know that that's what attracts uh, the players. And then if the players have the time to actually show up, uh, they'll do that. It, it, it's tricky. It's it's very tricky. So having very experienced and very well-funded fighters on your side comes with some drawbacks. It takes a lot more to motivate them. Well, seeing as we normally meander on around a topic for quite a while, shall mm-hmm. we, now that we've actually got the chance to, shall we actually kick off an AMA with you and actually get some opinions out of you for once versus <laughs> being the neutral spectator? Yeah, absolutely. If you guys want to ask me anything, go ahead. I'll answer just about anything uh, that I think. I don't know. I don't know what an AMA is. I think you answer the stuff you want to answer. You answer the stuff you think is productive. Uh, you don't answer everything, but you answer the the stuff that you think is productive. So I am now open to any questions that you guys have. And here's the first one from Jade Cougar. Do you want to read it, or should I read it? Just to have some. Variation. I can read it for you. That'd be great. So Jade asks, how do you feel you'll be able to convince the rest of the CSM to alter its path of improvements and quality of life towards the return of the vision that CCP had in the past? Okay. I think that's in relation to yeah. the post that Jess the Trek made about how CCP was always on the cutting edge and you know developing new things and having that vision of being the latest and greatest in many aspects. Yeah, so CCP in the past was known for being bold and having vision, uh, and so they would basically really accumulate a lot of design debt in order to make these bigger uh, features, right? Like they put up uh, Titans and they had no idea what that would mean in the long run, but it was fantastic and big and spectacular, so they would put that out and accumulate a lot of debt because when you put out three or four of those it's not a big deal, right? The, the game can sustain that. It's just a, a subject of awe when you see one because they're so rare. But now you have groups that have literally hundreds of them. Uh, Goon Swarm probably has in the neighborhood of 800 Titans. And so that's that now has to be rebalanced or had to be rebalanced. So, and that's what I mean by design debt. Like you need to fix how that fits into the game for mass quantities. Um, So in the first part of EVE Online, you had uh, developers who were really striving to do big things, uh, shockingly interesting stuff, and it was very exciting. And, 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 uh, you know, each expansion felt like it was actually expanding the universe. You had the drone regions created after the game started, 
Um, you had wormhole space developed after the game had started. These space, these areas did not exist when, when Eve really started and actually in the first few years. So uh, the game felt like it was growing and it was what they called their march to 200,000 players, right? That was their goal and they were marching up. And if you look, you can see them really doing well. But I don't think it was until they got onto Steam that they really picked up Steam, pun intended, uh, because that gave them a wider audience. And a few things happened at the same time that made it attractive. There was good publicity about it. It was a sandbox, which people were looking for. As another sandbox, Star Wars Galaxies was uh, falling away. And um, so there was a, a transition of players there. And so there was some, some things. But basically, you had this buildup of features and people coming and excitement. And it hit this wall of expectation uh, called walking in stations or... They actually called it Ambulation, um, but it, those were code names for what it actually was, which was a character avatar that would walk around a station, and then you could get into your ship and fly around if you wanted to. And that was a dream, right? Because now you have a sci-fi universe that more people could relate to. All that happened during the Incarna expansion. Um, and the Incarna expansion was literally them running out of gas and accumulating a bunch of design debt that things they needed to fix in order for it all to make sense. So what happened is there was a massive pivot, a massive pivot to balancing the game. And so all they did was go into emergency fix this game for the players. And what CCP communicated at the time was, we get it, we understand you, we're going to fix all the stuff that you complained about. And after that, expansion after expansion after expansion literally was mostly fixing the game as it was. And then came CCP Siegel. And CCP Siegel said, okay, we're going to revitalize this, um, this game by putting out code, erasing some of that design debt, putting out code for pauses, and getting that out of the way since they can't really work on that anymore. They can't iterate on it. Either they, I don't know why they can't, but they just can't make that any different than it is. So we'll just have to replace it. But that takes a long time. And it took a lot longer than she expected. And that was one of her regrets when she left. So for the next five years, there was a plan. And I think she got through four years and we were only halfway through some of the plan. So it was taking longer than it should have. And, and that was um, a few years ago. So <clears throat> she didn't leave a few years ago, but that was, I think the plan was from 2010 to 2000 or 2012 to 2017. I think those were the years. So we're past that and we're not finished, right? Some of the stuff promised is still not here. Um, and they even went to a point where they're like, okay, no expansions, no big promises. We're just going to, uh, put th things into the game, like some kind of, uh, app and you will get stuff back. I mean, you will get stuff. It'll constantly be upgraded, but we'll only ever talk about features that are kind of, kind of big. And then they realized there was, that was a mistake. Why? Because there was no marketing. There was no event to market around. And that was a mistake because, expansions bring people back to the game to check out the new stuff. So you have to have some new stuff during an expansion. It also brings in people who've heard about the game, but don't know if they want to play it. And then you release an expansion that has expanded gameplay and they're like, I'm going to check it out finally. So that's kind of what expansions do for you. So they went back to expansions. They didn't say, they didn't promise every two years. They just said, whenever is a good time for an expansion. That gave them some wiggle room not to have to design every two, every six months, which is what it used to be. Um, but I still think that it's very much in a state, and I think CSM very much pushes the post-Incarna model, which is balance the game, balance the game, balance the game. And I think that's fine. I just don't think that you want to sacrifice all your de development time to balancing the game for the players that are still here. I think you want to create expansions, create new forms of gameplay that other people can come in and pioneer. Otherwise, EVE Online becomes a game that old players have locked down 
And I don't think balancing ship statistics and what ships uh, is the flavor of the month or what doctrines work best now really moves that equation at all. I think you need new gameplay, new imagination, and you need more, um, more of what it used to be. So Ripard and I agree on this. You need to get back to some of that um, bold thinking of uh, bringing out you know, developing a new faction warfare, but not, not just rebalancing faction warfare, but actually a new faction warfare or something, right? All the growth happened in the first eight years, and now you just have a cleaning up. It's time to, like, attract players by giving them new things to try to master. I hope that answers your question about Vision. I didn't read his question, but I, I think if he's talking about what I'm talking about, that's what, that's what I'm thinking. But the actual question was, how do you influence CCP to do that? Well, the CSM is influential. There's no doubt about it. I think that it, if you're in the room at the table when they're talking about the pathway, when you have uh, ghosts talking about what it is that corporations are looking for to, to make them more effective, those are questions that can be answered by a candidate like me uh, from a different perspective than what's offered now. Most of the guys, I think, in, the, in, in CSM are smart and they can talk about things that go way beyond what they play, for instance. But I also think that they're all constructs of the same kind of thinking, which is uh, scion thinking, which is this game lives and dies on big battles that get publicized out there in the public. And I reject that that's the only way that Eve gets publicized. I think that Eve gets publicized by creative thinking, like you see with service-oriented corporations that do a thing uh, that's very interesting. They find a niche and they develop it. I think that's super interesting gameplay. I think uh, people like Signal Cartel, who will rescue you out of a wormhole if you get lost. That's very imaginative. And that's something that you can publicize EVE Online with. Uh, look at the interesting things they do. I think a ton of financial stuff can be done in the game to bring people in that want to use Eve to kind of model, um, uh, you know, model financial tools and stuff like that. Um, the players will take care of a lot of this. I just think CCP needs to lay some of the groundwork for that. And I think some of the priority needs to come off constantly rebalancing and move towards uh, expansionary thinking where the, the universe grows again. I hope that answers your question, and I've probably been asked five or six since then. Let me go look. Uh, there's been a few. There's been a few. Are so, you McLeod, yeah. McLeod answers a very quick and easy one. Pineapple or no pineapple on pizza? I hate those fucking questions, and I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> um, the next big one I'd actually say is, is if you could change one thing. So if there's one thing you could either bring to the game or change, what would it be and why? <laughs> well, I'm just laughing at McLeod laughing. Okay, McLeod is like one of my best buddies here. So. Um, yes, so if there was, sorry, if there's one thing I could change and why, what's that? If there's one thing you could add or you could change, what would it be and why? Oh, there's a, if there's anything that I could change, it's, uh, I don't have any one mechanic that I would change. And I, and I don't think that, um, it's even fruitful to have like a certain agenda thing. And I, I know that's not the question, but I'm, I, I'm stretching that question out to, to kind of explain something that CSM doesn't, CSM members can, if they want to go in with an agenda of things they want to change. Um, I don't think that's productive because um, you can be a player and you can make that suggestion and you essentially get the same response. So instead of looking at it that way, I have a different way of looking at what a CSM bid is. Um, and that is more um, overall direction saying, uh, you know, uh, CCP, you need to focus more on stuff that appeals to people who read the game. Because a lot of people say, oh, Eve is really fun to read, but I would never play it. And why wouldn't they play it? Let's ask that question. Why wouldn't these guys play it? If they're interested in the product, why wouldn't they play it? And uh, a lot of it revolves around time commitment and complexity. And also it's ruthless. And then you have to dissect what it means to be ruthless. So if I were looking at EVE Online, or if there's a thing that I would want to change in EVE Online, I'm not sure what that would be. You ask me about any one thing, and I'll have an opinion about how it works and doesn't work in a certain 
perspective. Uh, for instance, one of the things that's come up is uh, scamming, you know, um, or, you know, just general accountability for, for players, whether they're your court mate or somebody that you're trying to meet in, you know, in public and you don't know who they are. I would like to see that changed more than anything. I would like to see accountability for players that do the easy steals, the easy ex exploit, not exploits, but easy um, um, market scams. Like I would like to see some accountability for people who are just kind of a virus on the function of being social. I guess that's a thing. More than anything, with that question, I wanted to exemplify that I, I don't see the CSM as a group that goes in and talks about one thing to change. Um, maybe that's a facet, you know, like I know there are people who have done things like that, but uh, I, I think of it as more of a point of view. And you talk, you talk to them about their messaging, you talk to them about their marketing, you talk to them about their overall direction, and you let the game developers be the game developers. So... Button's been brought up by Ginger, so I'm going to split this into two simple questions. The responsibility of policing butters, should it be mainly on CCP or should it be mainly on Alliance leadership? That is a really good question. Whose responsibility is it to clean it up? Uh, players are inventive in this game and they will do service-oriented work uh, for reputation. I think you even see that with Riot Rick who broke off with uh, Slice or his group broke off of Slice from Dead Coalition, right? And he's gonna aim to attack botters. And you see groups that attack botters in the drone regions and they're doing it as a service to everybody else because everybody hates botters. Uh, but at some level, a CCP is responsible for people who are using automation to get ahead in this game. There's a huge question of fairness with botting. If I am doing all that I need to do. I'm planning things and I'm putting in the game time and I'm organizing my guys to do a thing and I'm getting outperformed and outpaced by one guy who set up macroing on his computer to, to do the work of 10 or 15 guys 24 seven. There is an inherent instability. There's an inherent injustice to that because that guy's getting ahead by using automation while we are playing this game and falling behind. And that's where a lot of the anger comes from. So whose job is it to catch that is a very good question because I think player solutions are good solutions most of the time. Uh, and so if you want to hunt them for reputation or name and shame for uh, as punitive punishment for people who are botting, you can do that. But they can escape that. There's no accountability for them because they can essentially create a new alt to do the same thing with a different name in a different place uh, at will. And that's the nature of EVE Online is you can es escape your identity and essentially recreate it in a different character and start all over again. So it's hard for players to really put an end to that kind of a problem. I imagine the CCP has tools that are far superior than what players can see. And so it's their responsibility to enforce the EULA, the user end license agreement. And part of that is that they, people should not be using automation to get ahead. Um, and so, yeah, CCP has a responsibility and players have a responsibility too. Now, here's the thing. CCP said, and this is what the big stink was about. CCP said, the people who rent land, basically, rent space on the map to people who are using bots are responsible for those bots happening. And I, I agree with that perception that, look, if you're going to have a group that turns a blind eye to what anybody does in space that essentially they control, then the leadership and organization has some responsibility for that. Now, they didn't, uh, CCP said that on stage in Las Vegas, I believe. And it was the executive producer or one of the three executive producers of Eve that said that. So it's coming from the top. The extent of what responsibility means is unclear, but I think it means that you, uh, if, you in, in, if you get money from people who have earned that money, 
uh, because uh, that group is paying you rent and you are receiving the rent and the rent money is tainted because it was acquired by bots, then that money gets taken away from you. Okay, maybe that's what they meant by accountability. I think they could do a bit more than that, though. I don't know the, yet. Then let me expand it a little bit. So if we say alliances and alliance leadership have a bit of responsibility, if CCP turned around and started saying to those that are providing known safe havens to botters, so that the, the alliances that are, have got a track record of having botters within them, if CCP started, you know how they take the money away from known botters. If they started finding the alliances, the equivalent is as well out of corp wallets. So it's not just taking the ISK out of the game. You're now finding alliances and corpses wallet, you know, this ISK. Yeah. They can't pay rent. They can't own safe space. Is this a viable option? Is this a good solution? Your thoughts? <laughs> I don't know exactly what the form of punishment would be, but I like the idea of extending it beyond, oh, you had money that you don't have anymore. I don't think it's an issue of just taking away was what was ill-gotten. That's not how it works in real life. If you steal uh, money from a bank, you don't just get to put the money back. You know, you pay a price for the crime as well. And this isn't quite the same thing, right? Because it's more or less turning a blind eye to something. But I love the idea of forcing players to be more careful and to select a police force that doesn't just police people from attacking it, but actually polices the area and is responsible for maintaining uh, 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 maintaining that it that it, that illegal things aren't going on in that area. I think that's kind of interesting. Of course, this hey Astrothi, this isn't in the construct within the game, right? But it is a construct of the meta game because now the company CCP is telling the players to police their players, and it's a little bit removed from actual in-game stuff. Um, but yeah, there should be more more punishment than just losing money. I think there should be some penalties. Uh, I don't know what those would look like. It takes a game developer to, to try to figure out some of the actual mechanics of what would happen, and you know, or a game policy. What's up, Ash? Days ago, CCP Pelagro posted, what's unacceptable is repeatedly harboring cheaters, profiting from it, announcing your, to your alliance that they shouldn't report bots because of lucrative, it's lucrative to tax them. That's not gameplay. That's enabling a major issue in EVE Online, which CCP is. Keep in mind that there is complete traceability of all assets in EVE. So what comes from a bot is going to be chased all the way downstream. We are going to be more thorough. We have a bigger team working on improved procedures and tools to do exactly this. Team security sends their regards. <laughs> yeah, that sends their regards is kind of funny because that's what Matani says. Sends sends their regards. So it's it's uh, it's language that's actually a little bit meta. Uh, surprised they said that. Okay, so Peligro is right though. I think you need to. I think you need to do more than just take money away. If you're harboring cheaters, that's that's a problem. If renting is a problem, as if renting is a problem in EVE Online, then it, there should be a way to dismantle it. Uh, or, or there should be some kind of development to look at that and say, is this good gameplay or not? Now, here's the thing. Why do people rent in the first place? It's to harvest at a higher degree than you can in low sec or, no, or high sec. And what you give up is safety. So what you're doing is you're trying to do both things at the same time. You're trying to get a high degree of profitability out of your industrial or money-making uh, errands. And you do that by, by letting somebody have 10% of your winnings, basically, or uh, 2 billion per system or whatever it is. Because you're going to make a lot so, more than 2 the billion. Interesting thing, the interesting thing about that letter by Pelligro, and you know, at, at risk of sounding too gurgoons, there are at least two tongue-in-cheek references to the Mitanni in that statement. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, the questions are coming fast and big old questions. So if, if you could help me read those, that'd be great. Yeah, oh, I've Lordy. got another one waiting. Oh, go ahead. So knowing that you're not representing one single area of the game, you know, high sec, low sec, and all, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are there any areas of the game that you feel need more attention or more focus in terms of new features or new gameplay than others? Yeah, I, I think that those constructs are very artificial. I mean, a player who is in null sec is probably in high sec too. Uh, so of course they understand that gameplay and probably low sec or you know understands low sec very well. I think when people talk about 
null sec or high sec or any of that kind of stuff. They're actually talking about gameplay, right? Like the, they're saying, oh, you know, we can't really uh, do the thing that we want to do uh, very well. Um, and I think of those, you know, you can be specific about gameplay because again, Eve is multiple games. It's not just one game. There's a ton of games inside of one game. Uh, you can, and, and, and sure, some are going to get developed at different rates than others. And CSM, I think, can influence that quite a bit. Are there areas that I think uh, have been neglected? Sure, there are plenty, plenty. Um, f one of the areas I think that could use some more gameplay is uh, the markets. This happens every morning. Hold on one second. I was actually just reading something about that. Um... I don't know if it was from Jester's thing or somebody was talking about how um, basically CCP has given up on the market now that they don't have um, the um, CCP, whatever his name is. The, no, the I think that's overblown. Uh, they don't I have think, the I do economist. Too. Yeah. yeah, I think that's overblown. I think um, it depends on who you talk to on how valuable it was, but it was a very good PR tool. And I think you need more PR hooks for Eve online. That's one of the things I would ask them to do is like consider PR hooks. You know, what, what makes the game interesting for people to think about, uh, having an economist run your economy is I think very sexy, right? If I'm somebody who's interested in how markets work, I'm like, wow, I'm going to check out Eve online. Maybe I can learn a thing or two that can be applicable to my real life. So I think the problem with markets is, yeah, they haven't been developed since, what, 2003? They've been prettied up, but the market works the same. And I think the market is complex. It's too complex for a new player who just needs to buy a little bit more ammo so he can finish his mission because he was shooting out of range. That happens. Um, and it's not complex enough for people who really want to work with, you know, modeling uh, financial tools and stuff like that. Now, I'm not a trader in real life. Um so I wouldn't know like how deep these go, but I know they can go a lot deeper than what was available in 2003, which is what is what our market is based off of is software that was built in 2003. So things have evolved, especially in financial markets. Let's bring some of that kind of thinking into EVE Online and make the economic gameplay a little more interesting for advanced players. At the same time, I think you should turn it a lot more into a shop for people who just need to buy gear so they can get their mission done right you don't need to teach them the complexities of a marketplace and how not to get ripped off by it um when they're actually just trying to do something else like i think it really gets in the way it's in an it's not in a great state i also think industrial needs some active gameplay so you can you can actually dedicate yourself to being an industrialist and right now it's kind of a baking situation where you put things in the oven and then you wait till it's done and it's easy, it's easy to build 200 things. It's, uh, it's as easy to build 200 things as it is to build five. And I think you could change that with some more active gameplay to build less things at a higher cost, that sort of thing. I remember that, that you know, back in the day, people would constantly talk about how they wanted the, um, the industry side of things to be improved, to be um, you know, more flexible or more customization. And CCP's answer was very clear. It is industry. It is not crafting. Now, I don't know yeah. whether or not that has changed, but well, you know, the that, abyssal is, stuff that is a very has. clear answer. Yeah, the abyssal yeah. stuff is really kind of closer to crafting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, um, uh, it's so funny. Somebody said, trader. Oh, I mean, trader. <laughs> Who was that? That was very funny. Saber 3000 blackout. Hilarious. Um, yeah, financial gameplay, man missing a huge opportunity that's sexy as hell to people outside the game who might say oh virtual world let me check that out now uh, i'm not on csm so i don't know if like well we can't do that because there'll be a russian crime wave going through just like you know uh, rmt or whatever and okay i didn't know that but but i think it would be really interesting to and maybe that's a different problem right solve your security problem differently but make more advanced gameplay for different sectors of eve i think that is a problem that csm can push for fixing I have an interesting question for you. This is the one that I've been chewing on for a little while. Mm -hmm. Why are skill injectors so destructive to the game when the bazaar was not? Yeah, I see. That's what I don't get either. I don't get that either. Um, I you think I figured it out. Okay, let's hear your answer. Because of the profitability of being a skill farmer. You can get to the skill level that you want and then just kind of cut off the side 
and therefore it is a secondary income. So Whereas you're before, you yeah. had to complete the entire person and then sell that whole person, and then you don't have that anymore. Yeah. So this is a renewable resource, whereas before it was not. Yeah, and also the you know the the resource that you would buy came uh, at a price. You couldn't change its corp history. You couldn't change its name. You couldn't change you know if you if you bought the bizarre character, you were stuck with whatever it was called. So you were never using it as a character in the game. You were always using it as uh, a means to an end. Which is different than skill injectors, because skill injectors allow you to groom the character that you're building, and it can be a lot more of what you made, and you can have a lot more attachment to it. Uh, I'll so there bring two points to that as well, because the, the thing is just skill injectors versus the bazaar was, the bazaar, it was, you bought what you saw, that was it, you had no option to do anything else, it was like, mm -hmm. is that the character that suits your needs? Yes, no, that was it. With skill injectors, it's like you can really fine tune how you skill everything perfectly. The other thing about it as well is that when you get up into the higher SP regions, 80, 90, 100 million, you go, right, that's it. There's nothing more for that character to do is you can stop its training and then use the excess skill points that you're accruing naturally, as, as Astros said, a second income source. Mm -hmm. But while this is also feeding into the fact that it's it's another passive form of income that it's you know you're not playing the game to do it you're just oh a month has gone by just let me just log in for five minutes do me four or five clicks and that's it there's you know whatever 1.1 billion isk now i really do believe it is a yeah, it is a supply side issue oh, not a not a um uh demand issue which causes me to think about that like that might be the answer of how to fix it right like what happens if well, if you extract skills, then for the next month, your skill training is reduced because your brain's fried. You know, like somehow deal with the supply side of it um, as a way of preventing it from running away. Well, listen, we all know skill injectors were put into the game to catch people up. Nobody wanted to join a game where it was all it was all solved by players who were already playing. You know, who would join a game? Who would join an MMO? where the kings were already decided and the best you could do is maybe own a shop as a serf. Like, who wants to play that game? Nobody. And, Nobody who's competitive. And to, and to reinforce that point is you have a look at the amount of people that have came from Serenity into places like Fraternity of the Army of Mangos. Would they have done that transition if skill, inject, if skill injectors weren't there? Well, I have no idea. That's a different question. Depends on what they were looking for. Uh, but... Where I'm get, what I'm getting at is that's what skill injectors were for. So, are they fulfilling that process? Profit um, that promise? It depends on the numbers, which we don't have access to. But CCP hasn't changed them, so apparently it's working. I suppose. Um, I would think about. I, I would think that problem could have been solved a different way with accelerators that over time don't accelerate anymore because you're just too immune to them, right? It's like a drug dealer you or a drug user. You've hit it so many times that you have to, you know, you have to hit it with 10 times the amount to, to get the same result. And, but eventually it doesn't even work on you. Uh, so the maybe problem is, is that it's injectors all demand into side. ceiling. So the problem is, is that if somebody gets banned, they can just immediately get their guy back up, right? So on the demand side, there's, I feel well, like price, the price will deal with there. Price will deal with supply, won't it? I mean, that's the, the fact is if they get too expensive demand drops, then people get stuck with merchandise they can't sell or the price drops and uh, the, the free market would determine the uh, but it, d demand side. Is that what you're looking for? Well, my point is, is that it almost doesn't matter because the supply side can always reach up to the demand right now, because all that it takes is people to decide that they just want to supplement their income, right? It's not a no-brainer, or it, it is. It's basically no-brainer compared to before, where it was like I had to sell my characters. Like let's let's pretend that the rope wall change happened in a world in which there wasn't skill injectors, right? We would still have thousands of rope wall pilots on the bazaar ready to be purchased. The ability to just have a rope wall would still be there, but those people will have cultivated those characters over time to make them those rope wall pilots. As a, and then, what, like I said, when they sell them, they go away. So it's this huge process 
for the supply side. Right now, for the supply side, it's not even a process. It's just supplemental income. And therefore, the supply will always reach the demand, which ends up being a huge problem in like this kind of world. Okay. Um, I don't want to derail from... I mean, right. we're getting into a discussion, which is great, uh, but I'm sure this has been discussed for thousands of hours by many players. I'm sure CCP has discussed it thousands of hours, and so has uh, the CSM. Yeah, 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 I just, I wanted to think about, because people keep talking about how destructive skill injectors are, and it, and it keeps bothering me that the bazaar used to exist, you know, the bazaar was the old solution, so there has to be something that makes it different now, and I don't think it's just people know about it more or something. Well, I, I've, I personally feel that the bizarre and injectors uh, both enhance the game, but also hurt it. You know, if you were not going to have injectors, then the bizarre is something you have to look at too. What what would be the nature of uh, basically making both those things go away? What would happen? Uh, I think it would be it would be really interesting to see. I think I think you'd see more illegal trading on eBay. Yeah, yeah. A lot of these a lot of these things. Plex, for instance. Um, and the character bizarre bringing it inside the game, and now skill injectors bringing that inside the game is a way of monitoring it uh, and making sure that the money is going to the company that built the game rather than people who are feeding off the uh, intellectual property that CCP created. So they weren't necessarily solves for the game. I'm going to leave that there. Um, but they were solves for problems associated with the game. So there's a lot goes into that, a lot of thinking that so, goes into that. So the next question then is, I'm going to sort of condense and slightly change these two questions from Jade and Ginger, is they're both bringing up points about Plex prices. Now, traditionally, CCP has been quite hands-off with the market. It sort of let it do its own thing with minor massaging by the uh, famous eco economist who sort of looked after it for quite a while. People have said with like the rising cost of plex and you know pricing people out of the game is it time shall we say for ccp to take a far more active role in looking at the market perhaps um, you know capping certain things or just doing something far more active to influence the market prices rather than just sort of sitting back and letting it sort itself out well all markets need to be regulated i don't think you can just have a complete and free open uh laissez-faire market or whatever um so I think the, the, the it's impossible to know how how damaging high plex prices are if they're even damaging at all. Like who do they actually burn out and why? We have hunches that it would be people in lower income situations or different countries with worse exchange rates having a harder time playing Eve because they can't earn their living in the game. In other words, they can't change uh, 12 days of grinding to earn the money to pay for that month so that they could play two more weeks. Um, some people say that botters aren't affected by high prices because they literally just bought and they're not doing any of the work, so they are not paying the price as far as time consumption. Uh, so it, it just, it, but it totally depends on what high prices do to the population. On the other hand, high prices make people cash in, right? Like you you actually spend money towards the game and you sell Plex because it buys you even more, even a better living inside of EVE Online. So you want to like look at that kind of stuff. And that's information that we don't we don't really have. So we can only make hunches. Do high prices uh, hurt? Yeah, if you have money and you're trying to buy time, you're paying more for it now than you ever have ever in the history of EVE Online. That hurts. That hurts the players who are old and who have a lot of ISK in, the, in their, their bank, but don't have a lot of spare cash to play in real life. Now, but the question is, is that does it hurt you enough to, does it hurt a person enough for them to leave the game? Because that would be an undesirable result. All that stuff, you need to look at the numbers to see like what the population's doing uh, to figure out you know, is this good or bad uh, for the game? So it, it cuts both ways, and there's really no way to know how much it affects the overall health of the game. One thing that I thought was really interesting about that, um, because I, you know, I I've also been of the attitude of like CCP asking CCP to do more about Plex 
always has rubbed me the wrong way because of just the nature of of Eve, right? So if they came in and it was like Plex will never be above six hundred million now, like that's not that would be fundamentally a very uneve thing to do, right? So, um, but one of the well, things the that fundamental eve thing out, again to say the fundamental eve thing to me rings as like that's very un-American. <laughs> just, well, fair enough. What? There, nobody ever yeah. says in Canada that's very un-Canadian. Like you well, never okay. hear that. Let me let me get to my point though. Okay. So somebody did bring up a really interesting point, which is that CCP actually hasn't done very many Plex sales recently, which is generally the way that they soften the the blow. Like right now is the 16 year anniversary. There's no sales on Plex right now. There hasn't been sales on Plex for several months. That's been significant, and that is only making the situation worse. Which tells me that there's a tent. It's not just that they're not stepping in to fix the problem, but they're actually removing the things that they used to do to keep the problem under control. Yeah. Well, that's what I meant by there's a lot of there's a lot more to it than just what's in the game. There's also how it affects the game. A lot of these things were actually externalized from the game, brought into the game uh, for exactly the reason you said, to monitor it. I'm going to ask a question here. This is from me. It's going to be fairly controversial. Uh, I think it could spark up quite a big debate. But Good. if CCP had to focus on one particular area, do you think they should focus on bringing new players into the game or catering towards what the older players are saying needs to be developed, needs to be fixed, needs to be introduced into the game. Which do you think they should focus on more? Bring new players into the game. I think and anything. Why? I think anything that you do that actually successfully grabs and and keeps new players will also improve the game for older players. It's like it's yeah. like doing accessibility stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Like everybody thinks about accessibility stuff as being extra work, but the process of doing ac accessibility will also improve just everyone's gameplay because it's just thinking through the problem and making things better. So yeah. if you make things better for new players, if you make things more interesting for new players, then at the very least you have more players. But probably have interesting things for the experienced players too yeah exactly plus you have more content for the advanced players look everybody wants to see this game have a huge everybody that i know wants to see this game have a huge population why there's more targets there are going to be more easy targets but all that fuel is new players and players that are coming back to the game right um that's that's who you want because even players that come back to the game this is not the same game they left they're going to have to learn they're going to be less they're going to be caught off guard etc a lot they'll have their wealth but that's you know one of the few advantages um, their wealth and experience and experience points and treasure but but they're still going to have to relearn some aspects of the game with with the help of friends but all the new players that you bring into this game um having like a virtual world you need people in a virtual world for it to be meaningful and so you definitely need uh, people coming into this game over and over again. That should never stop. Retention should be something that is, you know, CCP is really focused on. Uh, and I think retention, retention will clear up some problems. Uh, focusing on retention will clear up some problems that many players are having. That's what Ashtarathi just said, and I agree with that. If you keep doing, I'll promise you this, if you keep, acquiescing to the players that are here eventually those players they may stay here a long time there will always be a group of players that will stay here and play this game because they love it and they have a history with it and they have a ton of investment in it but at some point if the world feels small it becomes i think part of the draw for being here goes away as soon as something more interesting comes up in your life you'll be gone so you have to bring in new players because you constantly want to have that mixture of uh, people who play this game to build a reputation among people they don't know. That's a big draw, and you need people that don't know you to do that. If everybody knows you, it feels like a small town, and that's just not very exciting. I'm just scrolling through the questions to look for the next one. Are there a lot of questions or is it people going back and forth? Either one is good. But... A lot of comments um, yeah, go yeah, between yeah. 
your opinions, people's opinions, and then it's the comments that people are raising. Cool. So, hello, major sniper, directed at you, but there's mm. questions in there that you know perhaps could be used. Yeah. Well, this major sniper makes a point. I like that guy a lot. CCP tried uh, that already by introducing alphas. I don't know if it brought any good content to making it FTP, free to play. I think is what he means. Uh, that's an interesting question for both of us, Ashtaroth. The, the, uh, did, did alphas help the game out in, uh, in any significant way? Well, I, I think so, for sure. Yeah. Well, why don't you, why don't you answer this? Cause I know you have a big deal. You have a lot of thought put into uh, alphas and maybe I can help chime in. Yeah. Well, uh, I think that there's a few reasons why alphas have really helped the game. The two biggest reasons is that um, it helps alleviate the pressure of a new player, right? So it used to be you join the game and then like people would burn themselves out because they would try to plex their account in 21 days. And 21 days of play, right. you know, plexing your account in 21 days as an alpha is just not going to happen. But as, uh, or sorry, as a new player. But now as an alpha, you pretty much have as much time as you want to figure out how, how you're going to acquire your money. Now, there's a lot of people that end the feeling that Omega is a necessary thing, um, but I don't actually think that that's true. I mean, alphas, uh, given given the, the the that a new player generally sits at when it comes to Eve's complexity curve, uh, alphas are pretty much in it. Um, the biggest problem is the fact that don't have industry. So a lot of people join Eve for the sake of industry, but then they can't assist that because of the fact that they're an alpha, or they feel that it's unfair, they can't mine as good because they're an alpha, because of the whole complexity of alphas and letting them in and all that kind of stuff, right? So that's one of the biggest snags. But the other thing, the other reason why it's good is not for new players, but for returning players, right? The idea that I don't have to plex my account, I can just log in and basically all almost all of my stuff basically makes it so that coming back in and trying the game at any given time is all they have to do is catch my attention. I don't there's no additional financial step process before what's going on. I think your mic or our, my connection is screwing up your voice, but I think I understood everything you said. I'm, it's probably because I'm launching 11 clients of Eve right now. Yeah, so they're, it's glitching out. But um, as, as far as uh, alphas, you know, I don't have any statistics to show that it, it helped the game or not. I think the perception is that it didn't help the game. It just created people to have uh, other characters that they could turn on when they needed it. And they could always, they could, now they could do some things with those characters without paying. And so therefore you could switch inventory and do stuff like that, but you couldn't actually use it for a purpose until you paid. Um, I, I just don't have any statistics on that, whether alphas helped or not. I don't think it was, I honestly don't think it was a, something that would bring in new players in the long term. I, I don't, I don't, maybe it has, maybe there are people who live the alpha life, right? Um, but I, I don't know how it worked. It, to me, it looked like a very relaxed and extended tutorial process, which would give, which took away what Ashrathi was saying, that pressure of trying to figure out if you like the game or not, because it's too complex to figure that out in the first week. Uh, so by lifting that time, you, you can give a person longer to figure out if they like the game or not, right? So it's a game of hooks. Something's got to hook you to keep you there. Everybody says that it's, you have to join a group. I disagree. I think you have to find a thing. There's something that hooks you, something you want to accomplish, something you want to get good at, some, some way you want to master, uh, have mastery over other players. Those are different hooks. Um, and I think Alpha does allow you to kind of have the time to do that. So it might be a good thing. The thing is, a lot of people leave this game because they get they hit a wall that they can't get over easily on their own. It's it shouldn't be up to bringing people out of their introvertness to ask for help for another player to basically bail them out. First of all, we know that sometimes people mess with people, so you're going to reach out for help and you're going to be spun around in in circles that you, you know, don't help you at all. Or second, somebody with good intentions who wants to help you 
is not capable of describing it very well. well. We have a tool coming out that's gonna help that because you'll be able to point on the client what you're talking about. I try to help a guy out and it was incredibly taxing because I had to describe everything I was saying to him. And all he wanted to do was mine an asteroid and sell the proceeds so that he could buy some ammo. <laughs> you know, that's all he wanted to do. And it took me an hour of trying to talk to him over his stream to get him to do that. Uh, so that is a very inefficient system. Hopefully they're making more tools in that direction. But the biggest thing you can do for players like that to find their hook is to simplify the game for when they enter. One of the things Aerith did say is that players shouldn't be worried about what kind of ship or what kind of fitting or what kind of ammo they're using. And I completely agree with that. You get them into an unlimited situation where they can focus on the thing they're supposed to focus on so they can determine if that's enough to generate their interest to play a little bit longer before they find the hook that actually gets them. And that is a big, big deal. I think CCP needs to come to terms with that. New players, new players to this game uh, should, should really have a lot of their concerns that uh, require mastery of secondary systems to do the primary system that you're trying to do, should have the secondary system fall away so they can focus on the one thing they're trying to do. And uh, we've been really bad at that in the past so that somebody, again, who wants to buy ammo so they can finish their mission has to figure out how the market works and not have their little pot of money uh, taken away because they accidentally bought the wrong thing because uh, it's confusing or they got it stolen by somebody who said, I got the thing that you need and, and took it. Not, not to say that people do that, but you know. So ready, ready for the next question. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> so Ginger again has raised a nice question here. I'm going to change it a little bit because I think you can. This can be expanded. So he says, "Is one of the things you're looking to do is encourage CCP to publish a roadmap so players can get excited about?" I'll change it slightly and say, "Do you think it's something the CSM should focus on in getting CCP to give?" A clear guideline, a clear roadmap, as he says, for the next five years, as, CC as what CCP Siegel did um, when she sort of entered the role. Do you think that's important that, C that CSM should push for the CCP to release? The roadmap? Yeah, a roadmap mm. for the next two, yeah. three, five years. It has it has uh, pluses and minuses, right? Like uh, Torfi was great at hyping us up. I mean, we really bought his vision, and and that would really sustain us. And we get we'd see the trailer at the end of an expansion, and we'd be good for another month and a half. Uh, and then we'd start complaining about what was broken and not working. And then you know, then the next expansion came out, and we'd start the cycle all over again. So getting hyped about the game and where it's going and the possibilities is is pretty cool. Um, but it also has its disadvantages. Um, I think there's a balance between telling people we're going in a direction, that there is a vision behind the game, um, and that there is progress, right? The game is getting bigger, is how you want to feel. Like the game is going to be a bigger game in the future, because you want to be able to invest. You want that certainty of investment, time, money, attention span. You want to put that in Eve, you got to know it's going somewhere. So it's important to have something. But what I don't like is spoilers, although I benefit from them uh, myself financially. Uh, I don't like spoilers. So, you know, telling people like, oh, yeah, these jammers are uh, going to get fixed. Um, you know, that causes all kinds of speculation on how they're going to fix it. And so CCP has done a very good job of basically saying like, yeah, we, we hear you. We're going to, we're going to, you know, look at this. This will get some looking at without telling you how they're going to do it. So you can't speculate on the market to buy up all the things that it's going to switch to. Uh, I think they've done a pretty good job of that. And again, the pathway is important because it, it keeps people wanting to invest and it gives them hope for the future, which is very important to EVE players. I think it's important to me. Um, at the same time, you don't want to spoil all the surprises. I think that the surprises are, you know, how a powerful surprise is. If you look at the way Apple used to release their products, it would be like just one more thing and it would be a spectacular thing. And it was just really a good way of 
uh, hyping people up. And I, and I would love to see a lot of the surprises kept off of CC in some way so that we could, we could all get them at the same time. And then we could figure out, you know, people can solve these, uh, be the pioneers of mechanics in the game where it counts instead of, um, beforehand this is especially troubling with lore lore stuff comes out on cc and you don't even know like what where the lore is basically and that's all right i guess i don't know um let me see master sniper who's a good friend says he agrees that a level of darwinism uh in other words eve being difficult will keep certain players out and i used to agree with that quite a bit or keeps out the weeds uh weekly i don't know I don't think that new players are weeds and I don't think, I think what he's saying though, are spazzy players and stuff like that. I think Eve has tons of spazzy players that didn't get weeded out. So I don't think that is effective either. Um, I think the, the, the way you attract players to Eve online is you, you have new features and you have different hooks for different people. And then you also make sure that your messaging to the public is interesting, not just the same thing over and over again. I think that one of the biggest problems that we have when it comes to new player retention, am I sounding better now? Yeah, yeah, you sound great. Good. All right, so I think that one of the biggest problems that we have is that generally speaking, this is CCP, this is players, this is all of us. We see new players as little versions of us, right? And so what ends up happening, at, at even under the best of scenarios, we try to help new players get into the things that we find exciting. But the problem is, is that when a person first joins EVE, they generally have completely different things that are exciting them than us, right? Like a new player who just got their first thing and are just going to tutorial, the idea of joining a giant fleet is like panic attack inducing. Yeah. But you know what? You know what? You know what new players like? They like to go around and look at all the pretty stuff. They like to, you know, figure out how how their weapons shoot. You know what I mean? Like the very basic stuff. Eve is a very enticing game just on its surface. Some players. So, yeah. Well, okay, but almost a, sorry, a very large percentage of people who I have gotten to try out the game have immediately gotten hooked by how pretty it is because they join because they like spaceships they like space they like these kinds of things and so what ends up happening is they want to do those things but then they get frustrated by all of the nuances for what it takes to even just do that and yeah. anytime they try to seek out how to do that they just get told oh well you should do this other thing and then just get dumped with a bunch of stuff and then yeah. they're like, I don't get Eve. It takes too yeah. much time. It takes too much effort. I'm done. I think that's going to change dramatically with the 64-bit client uh, when people want to see even a move up um, to be able to zoom in and see all these ships moving and stuff. I think will be dramatic, very visual, and it won't require all the learning. I think that's what streaming is, isn't it? I think that's what streaming is. Let me watch this game. Take me through it. But what they see is not very exciting so far. Uh, I think that will change. And I think the, the kinds of streams that we do um, might have some kind of influence on that as well. Right? Like, you know, something that streamers can do is they can have learned it for you. They've digested it for you. And now they're just going to take you to what you want to see. Uh, I think that's, I think that's interesting. So this is going to be my controversial opinion. This is why we need straight up proper achievements right if for no other reason than for a new player to be able to kind of look around and see what's what there is to do the agency's good i think the new agency is going to possibly help quite a bit um but the idea of like hey uh, like right now if a new player joins the game and they think that everything's pretty they can't like there's nothing that says oh yeah by the way here are some places to go to check out some unique stuff, right? Maybe you should go check out the, uh, you know, Mar Prime, or you should check out Titaniomachy. You know what I mean? Like there is no achievement to going to Titaniomachy, and therefore the only way a player will know that it exists is if another player tells them. And while that's good for like the social connection, the connectedness of stuff, it's not good for a new player who wants to be enticed by this universe. 
I, I think that's a very good point. And it's a point that I've made in the past two interviews that I've done. I, they're unreleased, but they'll come out. And that is that you need, you need leaderboards that are not just about kill males. You need, um, you need something that motivates people to build reputation in the game, whether it's a scammer. And I don't mean the cheap smash and grab scams that, you know, just is rage quitting and taking everything with you kind of stuff. But, you know, um, there needs to be other forms of recognition for people who can plot out uh, takedowns in certain ways. You need recognition for um, a lot of, um, <clears throat> what were some of the examples? Um, you know, you can put recognition in, in any circles. And I think you call it achievement boards. Is that what it is? Well, no, I, I said we need achievements. Oh, achievements. So right now, right. yeah, we have, we have the agency, which leads you to things. Mm -hmm. And then we have the stats, which give you numbers on what you've, uh, what you've done. And then there's tiers to that. So like you can say, oh, well, I've now hit level two abyss. But what I'm saying is, is that the, like the EVE community has been super against achievements for like ever. And the reason why is because achievements is, is very popular in the broader gaming spectrum. And so a lot of people mm -hmm. like resist it because everyone else well, has it's it. Also, and it introduces a grind, doesn't it? Well, that's the thing. It has been, right? So achievements are used for basically two or three different things. Number one, to point you in the direction of what's available. Well, first of all, to reward early behavior, right? So you come in and everything you do is an achievement. And that's what a lot of people in EVE don't like, right? So as soon as they the tracker came on, everybody got a bunch of pings because of all of their mining and shooting and all that stuff. And they were like, this is dumb. And that, but that should only exist for just a very short period of time, right? Mm -hmm. Congratulations, you now know how to shoot. Congratulations, you now know how to mine. But there also should be more obscure achievements, things that are uh, worked towards that are not necessarily just a grind. Like I said, an achievement that says, go to Titaniomachy. You know what I mean? Like that, that is not a grind, but it is an objective. So yeah, that's what it is. An achievement is in a way of giving players alternative objectives. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know if I would call them achievements and for doing a thing uh, necessarily. Maybe it is the same thing, but I do think you need forms of recognition for other forms of gameplay. Maybe achievements is that. I don't one know. One of the things... One of the things that I thought of, um, and I tweeted about on Twitter, is the ability for a player to create their own goal, right? So create some sort of tool yeah. so they can, they can like, say, I want to build this much of this thing. Yeah. And then, as soon, and when you set it up, then it tracks it for you. So that way the players yeah. are basically building their <laughs> own achievements. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. That makes a lot of sense to me. And then they could be shared. There could be corporate achievements. Uh, that's the other thing. Like corporate objectives yeah. is another thing that really needs to be dr driven home a lot more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, but I don't think you get anywhere near corporate objectives until you start working out um, some of the permissions between court members. Uh, because a CEO will not share corporate resources with players until he trusts them and he won't trust them uh, pretty much until he knows them really well. So it takes a long time for that to develop. I don't know if that's a good thing or bad thing. I think they've put a lot more locks and safeties um, on assets, you know, than, than are available right now. I guess you can make BPO copies and then you just hand out copies and all this other stuff. But um, I, I think there needs to be a lot, uh, some that needs to be looked at so that you can hold players accountable that actually just fuck off and take everything um, well i'm not talking about sharing resources i'm talking about sharing goals right so like right now we track individual i know but i don't think you get to sharing goals until you manage the trust thing no but, but what ahead. i'm saying is is that like as a corporation we have mined 10 million units of rocks it doesn't oh. matter where those rocks went members of our corporation have done this members yeah. of our corporation have killed this many people have this much solve have you know what i mean so there, there are goals that we can work towards mm -hmm. um that doesn't necessarily mean that resources or the, you know stuff has to move between corporations although or members of the corporation although you know obviously the more you do that possibly the easier it would be to achieve those goals because trust is very important and trust is strength yeah again I, so, since this is an ma ma a a ma i want to say that ama those are 
the, the AMA. I said that, no? Okay, AMA. I, was, I, I, thought, was, you said, I, I was, thought you said MMA. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to interject fairly soon and start saying we're getting down to the discussion path again. Versus yeah, let's go back questions. to... No, I want to say this is a great idea, Ashtaroth. I could talk to you about him all day long. But so, again, one last thing before you go on. I just want to say that it's... This is more of a display of how um, I would think of things uh, in the CSM rather than telling CCP how to do a thing. It's more about putting the values back uh, and letting them develop the game. And that's one aspect of, of the CSM that I think is an important aspect that, that needs a little more help right now. So I want to reiterate that. Second, I, this is going to be the last question because I got to take off pretty soon. Okay, then this is going to be quite an interesting one for you. Uh, Matterall, with you having already one of the largest platforms to bring attention to issues to CCP via talking in stations and having such a wide audience base, what does your run for CSM give you besides free trips to Iceland? Okay, the free trips to Iceland, I, I would turn them down if I could. Uh, I have no interest in going to Iceland except maybe to vacation with the family. Uh, so I don't see this as a reward at all. Uh, I see it as a, as a bit of a burden. And since I don't like to fly or whatever, and my wife told me to get over it, um, it's just not, it's not something I'm looking forward to. But I do want to be at that table. I do want to sit at the table in an official capacity and pull um, the CSM a little bit out of their comfort zone when they're constantly uh, talking about balancing the game and... Uh, what amounts to large-scale PvP issues or small-scale PvP issues. I don't want to say that the CSM is not doing a good job because I don't believe that. I think they're doing a really good job, and they have for years. And I think Eris is one of the smarter players in the game. I think when he talks, it's, you know, it's very, very much worth listening to. And that goes for a lot of those CSM members, that even the ones that don't get recorded that often. Those guys are all very smart, and they know, very, they know this game very well. And they're able to talk about things. But I also think that they're constructs of a certain type of gameplay because they mostly come from NullSec. Even Brisk was NullSec. And I suppose I am from NullSec as well. But I certainly don't have the mindset of NullSec. I just understand it, but I don't, I don't really... My ideas don't come from it. My ideas come from a different place. They come from virtual world, science fiction, uh, literature, philosophy, and stuff like that. And also marketing, because that's my actual background. I worked in film advertising for a long time uh, as a graphic designer, but also as a marketer, and uh, I continue to work in advertising. So it's, um, it's very much, I'm very much approaching this as an alternative voice that would help bring that out. Now, I do have one of the larger platforms. Sure, I haven't measured it against other people's platforms, although our Discord is about as active as INN's, so it's actually about the same size. That is an accomplishment, especially in, I guess it's been a year or so. It's pretty good to have an organization that big. And I think a trusted organization where people feel like they can be heard and uh, an organization that I feel is um, has opinions from all directions, which makes it a nice, uh, even ground to, to, to come to, to talk to the other side or whatever. So we're not very tribal. We're not tribal at all, really. Um, that's not the same thing. Having that like megaphone is not the same thing for a few reasons. One is it's not really uh, talking in stations is not really my opinion about things. Uh, and, and, it, and it isn't even favoring my style of gameplay. Um, there's really nothing about talking in stations that I control beyond the tone. Uh, a lot of the work is done by other people. A lot of the content is driven by other people. And um, a lot of the, you know, because all the stuff that's being talked about in, in public, I let that go. That just, you know, we just moderate it to a certain point. But that's not any kind of advocacy that for this, the game style that I'm talking about. Uh, a lot of what you'll see associated with talking in stations is nullsec politics and because uh, we analyze the game. So it's not the same thing to be like a media personality. CCP doesn't bounce ideas off me. Um, like they might with Suetonia when they're, or at least when they're trying to figure out how to balance a ship or something like that. We need representation for the bigger themes that CCP develops for EVE Online. We need representation for how they message to players in the game and how they message to players outside the game and prospective new players and players who might return. 
Like we need a little more of that kind of a th that kind of thinking because I feel like, and I've said this before, I don't think that the current CCP with all the brain power they have would have ever conceived of signal cartels service oriented group or um, a website like Eve Travel where somebody puts down all the landmarks or space marks in the game for you to go and see and puts the history of what what that it compiles all that for you and tells you all about it in case you're interested and you want a place to go on the map or uh, Katya Sia's voyage where she traveled around the world she sailed around the world and through wormholes like that kind of stuff that kind of gameplay is not what the CSM is really focused on and that's regrettable because that's very cool stuff uh, I won't even mention lore because that's a whole nother thing. Uh, and I, I want to make CCP more aware that the place is a virtual world, not a war simulator. Because there are probably better war simulators out there. All right. Thanks for I helping would like me to out, stress, I would like to stress that it's not about you gaining a stronger voice, right? Because that's, I think, the fundamental of that question. You already have a really strong platform. What more do you need? And I think it's really when when everyone's in that room and they're talking about things, don't don't you want someone in there to break up the group think? And I think that's what you're trying to say. Yeah, I've wanted it to be somebody else last year. Um, you can hear that in my interviews at the end when the, it was decided we had a special interview to kind of talk about it. It just feels like the same people are walking in, not the same people as far as tribes, right? But the idea that everybody there is from a tribe and thinks in a tribal way. Oh, actually, I, I take that back. I don't think they think in a tribal way, but thinks about tribal structures. And I think you need people to come in and say, hey, it's not really about tribalism and what makes people fight and how that gets publicized. It's also about civilization and even, you know, the idea of safe drinking water. And <laughs> how fascinating is that in a virtual world? Stuff like that is, is something that people would say, oh, it's not really that important. And I think it is. Yeah, I don't need power and CSM is not a reward. And that's not what I'm looking for. And I don't like drinking, so it's not about, you know, having free alcohol. It's none of the stuff that um, I think people think the CSM is all about. Whether it is or isn't, I don't know. But it's not why I'm running. I'm running to put a different kind of voice on the CSM. Well... I want to do this for longer, but I'm going to have to wait until Tuesday because I've got to take off. Um, thank you guys for showing up. And Sarah Patikoff, thanks very much for reading the questions and adding some of your own. And thanks to everybody who asked questions. We didn't get a chance to read them all clearly, uh, but I, I want to see if you guys can stick around just for a second. Uh, let me see. I can bring my stream. I was planning on bringing my stream up whenever you're ready. Oh, shoot. Are you? Okay, bring it up. I'm sorry. I was about to... Yes, I should have said what I was doing. Yeah. I just, and just before you go, Matt Roll, make sure you're putting your CSM links everywhere so people after this stream can go there and ask you questions for next time, maybe, or, some, or uh, you can feed back to them via that uh, forum. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for reminding me. I'm on the forums. Let's have a look at where that is. Um, so... Actually, CSM 14 EVE Online. That's what you put into Google or whatever. And that'll take you to all you need to know. But then right below, you'll see there's some links here for people. Uh, so you could just go to any one of them. Like I'll go to Jurious Doctors. And that's his thread. So back up right here by clicking um, Campaign CSMs. And this gives you this list. And that list is all the, here I am at the top. It gives you a list of all the candidates and you can ask questions there. If this went too fast and you didn't get your question answered, go ahead and put it in the uh, matter all for CSM thread. Let me get that for you and I'll put it in here now. And also you can catch me anytime. I'm on a lot. I welcome strangers talking to me. Um, 
and uh, you can write in public and flag me. It's okay. <clears throat> Just don't flag like, you know, ELO or those people unless they expect it. Um, but yeah, so ask me questions anytime, any place, in public or in private, however you want an answer. And uh, <clears throat> we will see you there. And if not, we'll see you on Tuesday. And don't forget, tonight is Talking in Stations uh, with Artemis. And then Sunday, we'll have a Talking in Stations again on Sunday. Did I say that Sunday? Yeah, 1600. Thank you all for the follows and the subscriptions. And please follow us on Facebook. I'll actually give you that too, because we need followers on Facebook. Um, oh dear, didn't go to the right place. I'll have to type it. Yeah, we're close on Facebook. We we need a few more, but it's just if you put in it's face it's YouTube. Sorry, not on Facebook. Not on Facebook. Uh, I've been talking a lot about Facebook lately, but there it is. Um, YouTube slash C slash Talking In Stations will get you to Talking In Stations YouTube channel. And please subscribe to us there if you can. Let me test it to make sure it's right. That looks like the right place. Awesome. All right, well, this goes on. It doesn't stop here. And we're gonna dump into uh, Ashtarothi's stream. He's gonna talk about some stuff too. And then we will see you on the podcasts tonight and Sunday. And then we'll see you again on Tuesday. Oh, and by the way, I want to say thanks to Raiden Harmon there. He is the leader of Stream Fleet. He's put that effort together, a service-oriented group, which is, again, fascinating. That is fascinating stuff. But I want to thank him specifically for helping Talking In Stations interview uh, me, Exuki, and Jurius Doctor. We're all running for CSM. We're all part of Talking In Stations. And we didn't want one of our own guys to interview us. So we went outside and he was good enough to do it. And he did a great job. So that's Raiden Harmon. Thanks very much, Raiden. Okay. Um, is McLeod still around? Because I'll need to help have... Or Ashtarothi, do you know your... Um... Is Ash gone? I'm right here. Oh, good. All right, can you text me your... my uh twitch yeah so they can raid you yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah. hold on it's just sasharathi oh well let me try it it says talking in station used uh, i don't know if that's works or not <laughs> all right well, we're gonna stop the stream but we're gonna try to take you to ashtarathi so yeah stick around all right guys we'll see you later